Chapter Three of the Zeitgeist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Zeitgeist by Lily Dougal. Chapter Three. Bart Toyner was more than thirty years old when the period of his reformation came. His father had grown old and foolish. It was the breaking down of his father's clear mind that first started and shocked Bart into some strong emotion of filial respect and love. Then came another agonizing struggle on his part to free himself from his evil habits. In this fit of sobriety he went a journey to the nearest city upon his father's business, and there, after a few days, he took to drinking harder than ever, ceased to write home, lost all the possessions that he had taken with him, and sank deep down into the mire of the place. The first thing that he remembered in the awakening that followed was the face of another man. It stood out in the nebulous gathering of his returning self-consciousness like the face of an angel. There was the flame of enthusiasm in the eyes. A force of will had chiseled handsome features into tense lines. But, in spite of that, or rather perhaps because of it, it was a gentle, happy face. It is happiness that is the culmination of sainthood. You may look through the pictures of the saints of all ages and find enthusiasm and righteousness in many, and the degree of faith that these imply. But where you find joy, too, there has been the greatest faith, the greatest saintliness. Bart found himself clothed and fed. He felt the warm clasp of a human hand in his, and some self-respect came back to him by the contact. The face and the hand belonged to a mission preacher, and Bart arose and followed his friend to a place where there was the sound of many feet hurrying, and a great concourse of people was gathered in a wood without the town. It was only with curiosity that Bart looked about him at the high trees that stretched their green canopy above, at the people who ranged themselves in a hollow of the wood, one of nature's theatres. Curiosity passed into strong emotion of maudlin sentiment, when the great congregation sang a hymn. He sat upon a bench at the back and wept tears that even to himself had neither sense nor truth. Yet there was in them the stirring of something inarticulate, incomprehensible, like the stirring that comes at the springtime in the heart of the seed that lies below the ground. After that the voice of the preacher began to make its way slowly through the dull, dark mind of the drunkard. The preacher spoke of the wonderful love of God manifested in a certain definite offer of salvation, a certain bargain which, if closed with, would bring heaven to the soul of every man. The preacher belonged to that period of this century, when the religious world first threw off its contempt for the present earthly life and began to preach, not a salvation from sins and punishment, so much as a salvation from sin. It was the old cry, Repent! Believe, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The doctrine that was set forth had not only the vital growth of ages in it, but it had accreted the misunderstanding of the ages also. Yet this doctrine did not hide, it only limited the saving power of God. Believe, cried the preacher, in a just God and a Savior. So he preached Christ unto them, just as he supposed St. Paul to have done wanting nothing of the fact that every word and every symbol stand for a different thought in the minds of men with every revolution of that glass by which time marks centuries. It mattered nothing to Bart just now all this about the centuries and the doctrines. The heart of the preaching was the eternal truth that had been growing brighter and brighter since the world began. God, a living power, the power of salvation. The salvation was conditioned, truly, but what did conditions matter to Bart? He would have cast himself into sea or fire to obtain the strength that he coveted. He eagerly cast aside the unbelief he had imbibed from books. He accepted all he was told to accept, with the eager swallowing of a man who is dying for the strength of a drug that is given to him in dilution. At the end of the sermon there was a great call made upon all who desired to give up their sins, and to walk in God's strength and righteousness to go forward and kneel in token of their penitence, and pray for the grace which they would assuredly receive. This public penance was a very little thing, like the dipping in Jordan. It did not seem little to Toyner. 
He was thoroughly awake now, roused for the hour to the power of seeking God with all his mind, all his thought, all his soul. The high tide of life in him made the ordeal terrible. He tottered forward and knelt where, in front of the rostrum, sweet hay had been strewn upon the ground. A hundred penitents were kneeling upon this carpet. There was no more loud talking or singing. Silence was allowed to spread her wings within the woodland temple. Toyner, kneeling, felt the influence of other human spirits deeply vivified in the intensity of prayer. He heard whispered cries and the sound of tears, the prayer of the publican, the tears of the Magdalene, and now and then there came a glad thanksgiving of overflowing joy. Toyner tried to repeat what he heard, hoping thereby to give some expression to need within him, but all that he could think of was the craving for strong drink, that he knew would return, and that he knew he could not resist. He heard light footsteps and felt a strong arm embracing his own trembling frame. The preacher had come to kneel where he knelt, and to pray not for him, but with him. "'I cannot,' said Bart Toyner. "'I can't. I can't.' "'Why not?' whispered the preacher. "'Because I know I shall take to drink again.' "'Which do you love best, God or the drink?' asked the preacher. "'If you love drink best, you ought not to be here. If you love God best, you need have no fear.' God. The word embodied the great new idea which had entered Toyner's soul, the idea of the love that had power to help him. I want to get a hold of God, he said, but it isn't any use, for I shall just go and get drunk again. Dear, dear fellow, said the young preacher, his arm drawing closer around Bart, he is able and willing to keep you. All you have to do is to take him for your master and he will come to you and make a new man of you. He will take the drink crave away. He knows as well as you that you can't fight it. I don't believe it, said Toyner. Then the young preacher turned his beautiful face toward the blue above the trees and whispered a prayer. Open the eyes of our souls that we may see thee, and then we shall know that thou canst not lie. Thy honor is pledged to give thy servants all thy need and this man needs to have his craving for drink taken out of his body. He has come at thy call, willing to be thy slave. Thou canst not go back on thy promises. We know thou hast accepted him, because he has come to thee. We know that thou wilt give him what he needs. So the short sentences of the whispered prayer went on in quick transition, from entreaty to thanksgiving for a gift received. Suddenly, before the conclusion had come, Bart stood upon his feet. "'What is it, my brother?' asked the preacher. He too had risen, and stood with his hand on Toyner's shoulder. They were alone together, these two. The great crowd of the congregation had already gone away. Those that remained were each one so intensely occupied with prayer or adoration that they paid no heed to the others. "'I feel light,' said Toyner. "'Dear fellow!' said the preacher. The devil has gone out of you. You are free now, because you are a slave to Christ. Begin your service to him by praising God. Toyner stayed a week longer in the place, lodging with the young preacher. Day and night they were close together. A change had come to Toyner. It was a miracle. The young preacher believed in such miracles, and because he believed he saw them often. Toyner trembled and hoped, and at length he too believed. He believed that as long as he willingly obeyed God, his old habits would not triumph over him. The physical health which so often comes like a flood and replaces disease at the shrines of idol temples, or Romish saints, or at the many Protestant homes for faith healing, had undoubtedly come to Bart Toyner. The stomach that had been inflamed and almost useless now produced in him a regular appetite for simple nourishing food. The craving for strong drink had passed away, and with his whole mind and heart he threw himself into such service as he believed to be acceptable to God, and the condition upon which he held his health and freedom. At the end of the week Toyner went home to face the old life again, with no safeguard but the new inward strength. No one there believed in his reformation. He had lost money for his father in his last debauch. The man who was virtually a partner would not trust him again. 
He had a nominal business of his own, an agency which he had heretofore neglected, and now he worked hard, living frugally, and for the first time in his life earned his own living. The rules of conduct which the preacher had laid down for him were simple and broad. He was to see God in everything, accepting all events joyfully from his hand. He was so to preach him in life and word that others would love him. He was to do all his work as unto a God who beheld and cared for the minutest things of earth. He was to abstain not only from all sin, but from all things that might lead to evil. At first he saw no contradiction in this rule of life. It seemed a plain path, and he walked, nay ran, upon it for a long distance. Between Toyner and his old friends, the change of his life and thoughts had made the widest breach. That outward show of companionship remained was due only to patient persistence on his part, and the endurance of the pain and shame of being in society where he was not wanted, and where he felt nothing congenial. There was a Scottish minister, who, with the people of his congregation, had received and befriended the reformed man. But because of Toyner's desire to follow the most divine example, and also because of his love to Anne Markham, he chose the other companionship. It was a high ideal, something warred against it which he could not understand, and his patience brought forth no mutual love. When six months had passed away, Toyner had gained with his neighbors a character for austerity in his personal habits, and constant companionship with the rough and the poor. The post of constable fell vacant. Toyner's father had been constable in his youth. Toyner was now offered the post, and he took it. The constable in such villages as Fentown was merely a respectable man who could be called upon on rare occasions to arrest a criminal. Crime was seldom perpetuated in Fentown, except when it was of a nature that could be winked at. Toyner had no uniform. He was put in possession of a pair of handcuffs, which no one expected him to use. He was given a nominal income, and the name of constable was a public recognition that he was reformed. Toyner had had many scruples of mind before he took his office. The considerations which induced him to accept it were various. The austere demand of law and the service of God were very near together in his mind, nor are they in any strong mind ever separated, except in parable. Bart Toyner, who had for years appeared so weak and witless, possessed in reality that fine quality of brain and heart which is so often a prey to the temptation of intoxicants. He was now working out all the theory of the new life in a mind that would not flinch before, or shirk the gleams of truth struck from sharp contact of fact with fact, as the days and hours knocked them together. For this reason it could not be that his path would remain that plain path in which man could run seeing far before him. Soon he only saw his way step by step. Around there was darkness, but through that darkness, except in one black hour, he always saw the Mount of Transfiguration and the light of heaven. End of chapter 3